Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Gordon Stables, and I'm the director of the USC Annenberg School of Journalism. And I want to begin by thanking the inspiration for our conversation from Herb Scannell, the president and chief executive officer of KPCC, and Will Obey, our dean. They brought together the idea for our conversation about the future of news in Los Angeles, and we appreciate their inspiration. I think I could probably speak for many of us and say that the day-to-day -day realities of these last few months of the pandemic has forced us to scramble a lot and focus on the immediate, what's most urgent, what's most immediately in front of us. But the summer has also forced us as individuals and as communities to begin reviewing and reconciling so much of what we know and hold dear. The virus may have upended our routines and made us leery of being together in person. And in this moment of a pause from normalcy, we've also finally ruptured the polite consensus that so much of our society truly and meaningfully recognizes the inherent dignity in black lives. So our conversation today is an effort to however briefly focus our attention on the health of our local news community. My suspicion is many of you are here today because this subject interests you. And so you're probably as familiar with statistics and the norms as many of us in the conversation today. You're familiar with the dramatic decline in the number of independent news outlets, the shrinking of newsrooms over the last 10 to 15 years, the increasing economic pressure and editorial pressure that news communities are finding. You're also familiar with the increasing prevalence of social media traffic that for too many people takes the place of other forms of news information alongside the regular loss of TV ratings as the platforms and the ways that we get news seems to be as fragmented as our political opinions. But so much of this conversation takes place on a national, international level. The goal of our dialogue today is to begin to inform how this discussion relates to aspects closer to home and in many ways recognizing how Los Angeles, Southern California are themselves unique in size, scale, history, diversity, culture, and even economic structure. So today's dialogue is the first of a series of panels where we're gonna to seek to examine these dimensions of change in local news with an eye to ensuring how Southern California, our region, and ultimately our broader community have robust and informative access to news and information. Our panelists are gonna to seek to recognize what's changed, what's been lost, but also do so without overly romanticizing the past and recognizing the future of journalism and news in Southern California can and should be a vibrant collection of organizations and individuals who represent, recognize, and amplify the voices from and across their communities and to the broader public. To foster that dialogue, I'm so incredibly grateful that we've assembled a great panel of professional journalists. Um, thanks to each of our panelists for taking the time of their very busy schedules this summer. And so what I'd like to do is to introduce them to really one of the key voices in our conversation that's helped to plan and organize it, but who's also gonna help to moderate today's discussion. I'd like to introduce Tr Kristen Muller. She's Southern California Public Radio's Chief Content Officer, where she oversees broadcast, digital, live event, news, on-demand programming activities, and virtually everything else. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for being here today, and thank you so much for moderating our conversation. Thank you, Gordon. Sorry, it took me a minute there to unmute. That's the story of my last four months is I'm always on mute. <laughs> so I will uh, take it from here. Thank you for that. Uh, Let's start with some introductions. Uh, I'm not sure where everyone appears on your screen. So I'll, I'll start with uh, the one gentleman who is, is joining us and that is Leon Krauss. He's the lead anchor at KMEX, Univision's LA station, which is also the most popular station in our market. He's a prolific writer. He's contributed to numerous outlets, including Slate, The Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, The Daily Beast. He's also written seven books and held USC's Wallace Annenberg Chair in Journalism for two years. Erin Aubrey Kaplan is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. She was the first weekly African-American columnist for the LA Times from 2006 to 2007. And before that, she was a staff writer for LA Weekly and the New Times here in Los Angeles. She is also a prolific author. She's got two books, Black Talk, Blue Thoughts, and Walking the Color Line, Dispatches from a Black Journalista, and I Heart Obama. Thank you, Erin, for joining us. Christina Bellantoni is a professor of professional practice and the director of the Annenberg Media Center. She joined the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism in 2018 after serving as a member of the LA Times masthead. 
She spent more than 20 years in journalism and has worked at many outlets, including Roll Call, PBS NewsHour, Talking Points Memo. She got her start at a local paper up in the Bay Area. So thank you all for joining. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and I'm just gonna dive right in. Uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about this moment we're in and Leon, you recently wrote a, uh, an article for Slate titled, what's it like to anchor a local news broadcast during a pandemic? So <laughs> what is that like to anchor a local news show during this pandemic? What has it meant? What changes have you seen? Well, first of all, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's, it's great to be back on campus, even if it's virtually. I miss my days at USC. It's great to see old, old friends. And so uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here this, this afternoon. It's, uh, it's very exciting, frankly. It's very challenging as well. I mean, many things have, have changed, uh, most of them for the better. I mean, at the height of the pandemic and even today, we, we decided to focus our editorial approach on the community's most specific needs. We, we told the story of the day, but we also listened, I think, for, uh, for the very first time. That, that would be uh, overly dramatic. But we really listened uh, to, to the community's needs. For example, people were desperate to find ways to, to avoid being evicted. I mean, they, they just didn't know, know where to find help. Uh, they couldn't pay the rent. So we gathered our resources and basically offered people a, a blueprint to navigate uh, those challenges, those very specific challenges day in and day out. We became problem solvers first and newscasters second. We also partnered very closely uh, with, with authorities. That was, that was very interesting. We, we still demanded answers, of course. We still have this pugilistic uh, relationship as, as one should with, with authorities, but we also partnered with them. I mean, just to help people get back on their, on their feet. Uh, the major's office, for example, provided very useful information for the audience. And lastly, I would say, you know, it's, it's been very, very interesting because we also changed the way we, we broadcast. We do things on camera. Many people, many of us, uh, me, me personally, I stay. I broadcasted from from this particular room for a month, two weeks, and then two weeks back on the studio for for a couple of months. And you know, that uh, allowed us to share our, our daily lives and concerns with the audience. Uh, there was no more need for a perfect image, makeup, a perfect tie, dress. I mean, just journalists informing the community, normal people interacting with normal people, and the audience responded beautifully. I, I found it very. Challenging, exciting, difficult, but in the end, very touching. Aaron, what have you seen in terms of the journalism you do, you're doing and, and how you're thinking about this moment and how it's changed, or if it's changed, how you practice journalism? Oh, we got to unmute you here. There we uh, go. Okay, sorry. Well, frankly, nothing's changed for me. I mean, um, I work at home, you know, um, as a columnist and as a freelancer. Uh, that I, I think I do one of the few few kinds of work that actually was not at all interrupted by the pandemic. Of course, it's restricted me in other ways, but um, that hasn't changed. But what's really changing right now, and it's continuing to evolve. So I can't say how it's changed because I don't know yet. We don't know yet. But the whole media perspective. Um, the way we kind of even look at the country through the lens of Black Lives Mattering, uh, informally known as meeting the moment. And, you know, so everything, you know, as the pandemic has, has been, you know, that was the, the story for months because it touched everything we do. It's everything we do. So in the same way, the, this moment of Black Lives Mattering is really Americans shifting, looking at the country in a new way history in a new way. Um, and so that has, inf I mean, frankly, I've been writing about this for years, to be really honest, as a as an African American, I've been pointing this out for a long time. And now the rest of the country is catching up. So I'm sort of sitting back <laughs> and watching white people march, I mean, black people march in white spaces, and it's really kind of disorienting in a good way. And so I've just sort of, um, um, in a way, I've had to step up my own, I'm, I'm figuring out how to step up my own commentary because the things I've been saying, um, people have said, oh, you're being really honest. And but now I have to change my response. The things that I was not willing to say, 
you know, thinking it was going to hurt white people's ears, for example, I have to throw that away. I, you know, we all have to throw our caution away on, on all sides. And that's been my particular challenge as a, as a columnist and a commentator. Um, I've had to look at myself and say, what is it I have not been willing to say that I can now, you know, th th that, that I can now say that, that, um, uh, you know, I would have to look at my own restraints, which I hadn't been looking at before. So we're all sort of finding our new voice through, a, through not a new lens for me, but it, it certainly has changed and broadened my perspective. And I keep thinking to myself, am I allowed to say this? Or, am I going to upset anybody? Am I going to, you know, I'm so used to editing myself um, as a writer, even as a, even as a columnist in subconscious ways I wasn't aware of until now. So I think that this is all a positive. It's just so odd to have this dynamic going on with so much other oppressive stuff. Um, it feels like a real clash um, that will come to a head in some kind of way. I don't know how, I don't know where, but I think um, as, as journalists, all we can do is keep, you know, just keep our eye on what's happening and say it straight. And that's, you know, that is simple, but not easy. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, but I'm, I'm fortunate. I, my lifestyle, my work style has not changed. I'm just uh, have a lot more dog company and they get in the way. But other than that, um, I can't really complain. Christina, this is interesting, uh, both, both what uh, Leon and Aaron are saying, because it's really thinking of ourselves differently as journalists in that it's not just about broadcasting or reading or, or writing about the headlines. It's really about serving as kind of almost a help desk and, and part of that help is, is making sure people feel reflected and represented in those stories. And that's a new, I think that's an imperative that we didn't have or ha many organizations haven't always had in the past. So what is it that you're saying to your students who are uh, you know, the future journalists who are part of the pipeline that will, we hope serve Los Angeles' community someday? Yeah, um, great question. And uh, thanks to everybody for having me here. It's uh, always fun to do this. Um, so, you know, the way that I approach this, <clears throat> it started in the spring, I was teaching political campaign reporting, um, which is something I did for the course of my career, most of that in Washington, DC. And even my students, their, their final project, their big assignment was to go out and report a story that was relevant to the presidential campaign, and would remain relevant, you know, for a long time, you know, effectively a feature story about politics. And for everybody, they, they had to evolve what they were doing because we got the stay at home orders, obviously campus shut down, all these things kind of happened at the same time. So they were had to approach it differently the same way that my colleagues and friends who are still in Washington had to adapt. They found themselves needing to adapt. Um, but what we found in every instance is that the facts and the fundamentals remain the same, right? You have to get good reporting you have to ask a lot of questions and you have to look a little closer when people aren't in the hallways of Congress anymore or, you know, walk in the streets of Sacramento and the legislature, like you have to dig and use more documents and things like that. So I think the value of investigative journalism is going up even more in all of this. And then separately from that class that I was teaching, as you mentioned, I'm the director of the student newsroom, um, Annenberg Media is the news outlet. And what they found, you know, pretty much immediately, the very first day we started reporting under strange circumstances in, in March, I told them, you know, one, like, to reflect in this moment, like, take photos, think about what this is like, because you're doing something that, like, is pretty unusual and unique. And also like update those resumes because you are doing something that your peers in the industry that you're hoping to join professionally are having to do, right? How do you adapt? What are you doing to adapt? Take notes on this. And many of our students are leaders and trying to come up with creative ways to still get a television show broadcast on YouTube or put information out there on audio or write stories. And, and then finally, back to the facts and fundamentals, the, the Annenberg Media Newsroom reports about news that is of importance to the campus community, which is every student, every staff member, every faculty member, the people living around USC, the fact that it's the, the largest private employer in the second largest city in America, the information that we report for, for the Annenberg Media audience could save lives, right? Like these are really important health matters. And um, particularly for international student community, we found a lot of the students were really trying to help international students understand what was happening, what would happen if they left the country, what would happen if they 
come back? What are the risks? All of those different things. And and so I, for me, my impression was that the students felt like really an emphasis on like the need for good quality information that could help people. Over the course of the summer, we've kept that up. We have a summer team that's working, and as we're about to start this the fall semester in less than two weeks here, you know, that's the mission. Okay, how do we cover this unprecedented moment for this USC community um, with journalists who are just starting out? And you just boil it down to the fundamentals. You know, what is the information that can help keep people safe, that help people keep people informed, and also um, with the right tools, particularly when there's so much disinformation about there. And then yes, representing every single type of person who would have an interest in this. And that's a very, very wide range of people. And that's you know, a lesson that we try to impart to students every single day. Thank you. Um, as Gordon mentioned in the intro, the conversation around the future of local news and its sustainability is a national conversation, but I wanna drill in a little bit to our region specifically. And, and really talk about what makes this region so, um, so difficult and in terms of providing equitable and accessible information for, for all communities, because you know, we, don't have, um, we don't have the robust local news ecosystem that, that maybe New York has, but we are a huge city. Uh, our, our county has more people than for 40 other states, I believe. And, and Aaron, I wanted to get your thoughts on this um, because you, you've been covering LA for a long time. What is it about this place that makes the challenge of providing local news such a challenge? Uh, well, number one is geography. Um, LA is, uh, I mean, there's LA and then there's the LA adjacent. <laughs> um, there's, there's the Southland, there's you know, a county with 88 cities. Um, to say nothing of LA itself. And so it's very um, uh, spread out, of course, and it's a lot of ground to cover, literally. And LA has, is very segregated too. So you have, you know, uh, it's very easy to ignore a lot of communities. Um, you know, LA, the LA Times found this out in 92 when they had the civil unrest and there was a huge a huge event in the city and they realized they didn't really have they weren't paying they weren't paying enough attention they didn't have enough reporters and they created this you know kind of soul searching at the paper um and you know what they did before that was sort of break la up into zones you know there was south bay and there was um uh, what was the other sections uh, west side south bay west side and um, yeah. south, southeast was and, and also there was a valley edition and there was an orange county edition so they that was the that's what they did, but unfortunately, those those sections never touched. You know, they were like not contiguous. Um, uh, the business model of the the print journalism started to change, and LA Times lost half of its staff, half of its of its staff, which kind of indicates how you know media local media was going, at least print media, and so um, uh, now they're just sort of trying to rebuild, and we're and and now that we know it's important, we officially know it's important to cover everybody equally. The question is how do we, how do, we do that? And again, you know, um, it's first, it's, it's not just money's priorities too, which communities are important, which aren't, you know, um, where do you spend the most time and coverage? Um, and in LA, you know, it's just really difficult to bring all these pieces together. And, um, uh, you know, again, the, the new business model we're not really there yet. We have nonprofits um, um, like ProPublica. You know, we have um, what else do we have? <laughs> we still have you know local local ownership. The LA Times now has local ownership, and that's a good thing after being in the hell of you know being owned by a Chicago-based company. Um, they're coming back, so I don't think it's a quick answer, a quick fix. And uh, I wish somehow that 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 journalism was not tied to private enterprise because that has proven really, really unstable. Um, so I think the last conversation I had about this, someone said we need in LA a patron of journalism, you know, someone like the Chandler family who could step in and just, you know, um, just fund media. Um, we do have that with the new owner of the Times, but, you know, I don't know if that's sustainable. So I think in the meantime, though, as Christina was saying, journalism remains important. And it has to be done. 
And people aren't going to do it for free, though. And um, we all need to be paid equally. And this is the kind of the clash, one of the many clashes we're having right now between, you know, social justice and public service and capitalism. Not to make it too, I know this is a local issue, but it's a really big issue, too. So the good thing about L.A. is it has money. It does have money somewhere. We just have to figure out how to direct it to um, good local coverage. Uh, Leon, I want to get your thoughts on this because, you know, I think, you know, Aaron said something briefly when we talked yesterday about this kind of the notion of a collective LA identity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you think about how a sense of self as, as Angelinos, as I'll say specifically, how does that contribute or not contribute to, um, you know, providing robust local news to all communities here? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I should I should uh, begin by saying that I, I was born in Mexico City. I grew up in Mexico City and uh, L.A. has the same vibrant qualities that Mexico City has. But uh, you have to add to that the another variable, which is crucial, which is diversity. Right. I mean, the cultural richness of Los Angeles. Uh, of course, there's the other side of it, segregation, uh, which is which is not a small thing at all. But it's 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 such a such a diverse, complicated city. I mean, the, the one, one thing I always explain to people who ask me about living in Los Angeles is that this is not Disneyland. Uh, everyone thinks that California is this shallow place. And, and for me, frankly, uh, and as a Hispanic journalist all the more, it is really the most interesting city in the United States. It's the capital of, Lat the real capital of Latin America with uh, all due respect to my friends in Miami. Um, <laughs> And it also has what uh, a Mexican writer Ines Arredondo used to call El Rio Subterráneo, this underwater current, uh, underground current of passions that are, that are, I mean, sometimes even dangerous. So I, I find it an absolutely fascinating place that is indeed underserved journalistically. I, I completely um, agree with that. I mean, for us, you know, as the main, as the main uh, television station in Spanish, the challenge is to play to pay, I think, close attention to the whole community because it is not monolithic. I mean, we, we, we repeat this time after time uh, in the whole United States, but even in Los Angeles, it is really not the same to come from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. Now, there are many things that we share, of course. We share the love of soccer, <laughs> we share the language, and we share many other things. But there are many things that we don't share. I mean, the immigration story, for example, it is just not the same. Uh, so uh, it, 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 it certainly is a challenge uh, and, and more complicated and, and full of, of passionate uh, reactions than, than, than you would imagine, frankly. When, when one, for example, when the Guatemalan community thinks that we are focusing too much on Mexico, that, that's always an issue, right? And, and it should be. Now, I, I will add one more thing. I think that uh, adding a, a bit of self-criticism to, to what we do, I think that Spanish language media sometimes fails too acknowledge news that is not related to the community and in that sense we add to the sense of bubbles in, in Los Angeles this sort of segregation I think that's a mistake I mean so, sometimes we focus too much on issues that are specifically related to the community and, and but when we when we do otherwise the result has been very touching I mean I think the best example is the way we covered um, Nipsey Hussle's murder um, we, we went into the, 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 the community there in uh, the African American community. We told the story, and it, it, it and the response was phenomenal. And and I am really not talking about like an effort to to be diverse at all. I mean, we were just doing our job. But uh, the the value of expanding the lens of coverage really proved again um, not to be redundant, but but really touching and, and really valuable. So I think we have to work on that. Uh, in, in, a, in a city as diverse as Los Angeles, it, it is a challenge, but I, will, but I think we welcome, or we should welcome. Christina, um, let me ask you, I mean, is there in this moment, in this, how, how did you say it, uh, Aaron, uh, as this meeting the moment moment, <laughs> in this <laughs> right. the moment moment that we're in, um, do you think you'll do we will see local the local journalism scene kind of lean into the city more? Given that we've all had this, you know, uh, we've had so many of these issues of disparity laid bare, and you know, the city's economy, like the rest of the country, is going to take years to recover. Do you think we'll see more of a you know kind of we're in this together sensibility or 
um, you know, an attempt to um, strengthen relationships with readers or viewers in a way that we haven't done before? I hope so. God, that would be so wonderful. I, I mean, that's that's what should happen, right? And I um, I will say, you know, for me, I've really found um, local public radio to be a huge, like, lifeline in all of this. You know, I'm not spending that much time in the car, but when I am, the second I am, I'm, like, soaking that in to be able to get a sense of what's happening. And then also Spectrum News. Like, I have loved everything they have brought to the table since coming to LA. And I feel like I turn on the show and every whatever it is, I'm learning something about my community. Turns out I didn't know this when we planned this panel, but today is my five year anniversary of moving to LA. And I actually had, you know, what Leon is referencing, you know, that sort of I, picture of like Hollywood and shallowness and the beach. It's just like, I didn't want to come here, honestly. It was like a great job and I could be closer to my mom, but it was like, ugh, I don't, I don't want to go to LA. And actually I never want to leave. I, I really, I love LA. It, it didn't take long to feel like part of this incredible vibrant city, how diverse it is to raise my son who's half Chinese here in LA. Like those things all feel so amazing. Amazing. And um, I have found that being at home actually increases my desire to be a part of my community, my, my local, hyper-local community, and also learn more about it. So that presents such a great opportunity for journalism, you know, whether that's bringing back, you know, certain additions or at least just paying attention to these small communities. Uh, my interest has always been politics, so I start there, you know, right? Like whether that's rooting out corruption and looking for, um, you know, where there's issues there or even just what are the big issues in each neighborhood? right? Zoning matters, policing matters, um, how people need to recover after this, you know, awful economic year, how that comes together, what resources does your community need? Like we're all home and walking around our blocks. Like I can tell you right now, I know way more about like what is needed at the local school or the fire department than ever before. And so as a journalist at heart, I think about this, like the, there are just so many great local stories that you can tell about people doing incredible things, about local heroes, about small businesses thriving and small businesses losing and, and how we can all help that. And I think you always hear it when you talk to any average everyday consumer of our journalism, whether that's on air or on the radio or our written words, they want good news. I mean, it's like cliche. We know that yes, people also click on terrible news, right? All the focus groups prove that when you, um, but they really want to know stories that make them feel good or help them inspire their own communities or do better. And that's something that I think student journalists can definitely do. Um, we try to do it. We cover the South LA community. And the philosophy of that has always been is for more than a decade, you go in and you tell stories about entrepreneurs, you tell stories about communities and feelings and food and rich culture, not that stereotype that, you know, people are only going to go in when a giant, you know, celebrity is murdered or um, something bad happens or there's rioting. Like it is about just what is this sense of place? And I think that can be duplicated at every level, but why not start here in LA? That's great. Yeah, Erin, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. First of all, I take offense to that, Christina, as, as an LA native, how dare you think of this place as just Hollywood? Ah, just kidding. <laughs> um, but um, I just wanna add something to what Christina said. The stories that, it's not just the culture stories that need to be told fully and equally, I agree with that. But what we really need is to take a hard look at stories and have a point of view about them, like gentrification. In LA, you know, this is really eroding black communities, what's left of them. And the media sort of stepped back and said, well, you know, it could be good, it could be bad, you know, you get a Jamba Juice or you get a this. You know, we really look at what is happening with gentrification and, and what the real threats are to a say, black community and stop acting like it's only the black community's problem. Mm -hmm. You know, they just need to get with gentrification. There's a lot of, you know, there's, there's, I've been railing for years against this idea that the media has to be neutral. Now I'm not neutral because I'm a columnist, but I, I've been a reporter. But I think that you have to know what you're looking at and kind of understand the nature of what you're looking at and convey that in the, you know, as a reporter. In other words, I, this is my favorite example. If lynching came back into fashion, which doesn't feel that far off, frankly, um, we wouldn't sit here and debate about the pros and cons of lynching. We wouldn't sit here and say, well, you know, the pro-lynchers have a point. They don't have a point. You know, we need to say that in, in, in a really clear way as journalists. I think back to the Nixon era 
Oh God, I'm showing my age. But anyway, I was a kid, okay, in the 70s. But the media knew Nixon was wrong. The, the national media knew um, that what had happened was not good for the country. That is how he got forced out. So we have to, we have to understand the difference between sort of stepping back and being, you know, being neutral and understanding what is the nature of what we're reporting on, okay? Whether you're a columnist or a investigative reporter and not to stay with the safe stuff, like reporting on, you know, people coming together over food and stuff, that stuff is important. You know, the tacos and chitlins and all that, that's important. But what's more important are the issues that really do uh, shape the, that really do determine the quality of people's lives. Um, like gentrification, which impacts black people in a different way than it impacts Latino people. There's, there's a commonality, but there are differences and we need to parse those differences and not be afraid to look at those issues and understand that those issues affect everybody. You know, and the, and the lens from a, like, the, you know, the, 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 le the, the lens, the, the people of color lens is valid for all of us. In the same way, the white lens is valid. Well, we've been, it doesn't even have a name, but that's the lens we usually use. And we need to do all this without like, you know, beating each other up and pointing fingers. And it looks like we're doing that. So I just want to say that um, I do hope that, you know, from now on, we do like look at an issue like gentrification without backing away from the uncomfortable racial implications, because there are many. Because to me, gentrification, for example, is white return. I live in Inglewood, okay? Inglewood is a community. It was very white, like a lot of places in LA. It got, it, there was white flight after 65 when we had this uh, civil unrest. White people left, black people came, Lat Latino people came and now it's sort of half and half. And now, and now white people are coming back to sort of live here again. This is very complicated, like, like Leon said, this is complicated. And we need to be, be very attuned to that complication and not just put us in our own ethnic bubbles and not understand how this all relates, okay? And not be afraid to, to kind of peel away the layers and see where that leads us, you know? Um, so that was a long response to what Christina said, but just wanted to say that. Well, Leon, jump in, because I see you nodding vigorously. <laughs> No, I, mean, I love I love what Christina and Erin have, have said. Um, listen, I believe in community-oriented journalism, not, not only because Univision practices it daily, but because I, 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 it's, it's my personal calling. I mean, when I had the chance to teach at uh, USC, what, what, what we did was a project called La Casa, in which I uh, uh, invited students to embed, basically embed for a semester, with um, in, in, in the two years that, that we were there, we focused on Hispanic families. If, if, I, if I had stayed longer and I, might, and I might be back one of these days, I would, have, um, I would have loved to add to that tapestry that we were building, right? But uh, the idea was to embed groups of students with Hispanic families and then have them uh, emerge with a, with a short form documentary portrait of, of that family's lives, right? And um, what, what, what came out of that was um, really uh, touching, wonderful, illustrative uh, portraits of what um, the community is like in the particular, not the universal, but the particular. And we, we, we gave voice to people who are really voiceless. And by doing that, we really understood the dynamics within the community. And I think there are, it's very encouraging to see that uh, I imagine that, I mean, when I was a journalist, my when I was a student of, of journalism, my, my dream was to interview politicians, right? I mean, my dream was to interview the president of the United States. Uh, that was my dream. Uh, but my, my students, that, 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 that wasn't their dream. Their dream was to uh, faithfully uh, portray um, communities and families and individuals and explain how public policy uh, impacted those particular individuals. And it, it wasn't just my students or the students that I met in uh, in USC at USC, uh, I, I can think of, of one particular example that I that that for me is is really remarkable. Um, uh, Boyle Heights Beat, right? This very small um, uh, newspaper run by the community, where uh, it's it's the kids who actually write the stories and research the stories and 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 publish the stories, and it it's focusing it focuses. Uh, specifically on the needs and the concerns and uh, uh, of that community 
Uh, and the paper is really wonderful. I mean, really wonderful. The stories might be written and researched by kids, but man, I mean, <laughs> most of those kids, I wish I had them as reporters, uh, in, in all honesty. And it's because they feel passionate about community-oriented journalism. And that fills me with hope. And I think that has to be part of the path uh, going forward when, when we think of, of, of the impact and the importance of, of local news. Yeah, I would also point to um, the Alhambra Source as a good example of that too, which is a US, USC uh, related project. I guess one of the questions, and I, you know, this is all great, and I, you know, I also agree 100% with everything that's said here in terms of being more attuned to the community level needs. But the reality is, you know, we have a huge demand for our journalism right now, and the money is not there. There's been a huge loss of advertising dollars. Um, you know, outlets like Curbed LA have folded. There have been furloughs and cutbacks at the LA Times, at Southern California News Group, uh, KPCC's had furloughs. So I, you know, I'm wondering, um, and I don't know who want to take who wants to take this, but like, where's the where's the uh, economic underpinning for these um, for these uh, community oriented outlets and and if it's not already there who's doing the work to make it get there i'm happy to start um, on this yeah I, mean, I don't know that i have the answer but it is the business models of journalism, you know, all of these changes that have happened this year are just piling on to all of the cuts that Aaron mentioned that have been happening over decades, you know, particularly here in LA. For being the second largest city in America, you know, our, our news media is not as robust as it should be, period. Um, both, you know, geographically, you know, culturally, all these things that there, there should be more. And um, it's, it, it feels like there's got to be a reckoning, right? Whether it's you really get people to understand the value of paying for their news and um, just embracing that more. And maybe that's a mechanism, a delivery mechanism or some sort of model that allows people to be like more invested in lo their local communities. Or maybe it's the nonprofit model, um, which is sort of starting to grow. I mean, Cal Matters and Center for Investigative Reporting. I mean, there's just like tons where you know you have benefactors and maybe they have a particular interest or a topic they're fo focusing on, but it's very transparent. Um, you know, you get rid of that whole notion of like objectivity. It's just like this is this is the issue for the people that want to read our content, and we are going to pursue that with vigor and fairly with all of the best principles and practices of journalism. Um, so maybe that's an answer. Um, maybe it's local, um, you know, TV that is also doing lots of digital work. Maybe it's the community-oriented stuff um, that we're seeing in Vision. Like, there's just so many different ways that we can get into it. And I think the LA Times is really understanding that um, the cuts have hurt them, right? Like, you can't cover the community as fully if you don't have people working all of the time. Um, you can't do as much to inform your audience if you don't have a full staff that is of the entire community and also um, supported in the right way with you know the right pay and benefits and all of those things. Um, I like to talk a lot about Report for America, which is an organization that Annenberg supports and that I've been involved in as a judge. They have a really interesting model. It's like the Peace Corps, effectively. You know, they have newsrooms apply with a need of something that they want covered. And they have to kind of prove that they're in either news desert or that the area doesn't have resources to devote to it. So maybe that's, you know, the the methamphetamine crisis um, or you've got you know healthcare issues or recovery from a fire in a certain community so they're a national organization and then newsrooms all over apply for it of all different types of platforms they are paying half of a reporter's salary and then report for america covers the other half and then reporters apply and you sort of build this core and one of the things they are required to do is work in their community they have to have like a community project and they can stay for one or two years and that's a really great way both to build great journalism and many of these fellows are ending up staying on longer or they build into a program that has some sustainability and then in addition to that it gives training for our young journalists with that first job uh, providing what is you know a pathway that used to be very traditional when we all came up in these careers you know you would you know get your degree you would you know work hard as an intern somewhere maybe if you were lucky and then you would go to a mid-sized regional daily newspaper like maybe a smaller one before that and you would build on these steps but if those papers or smaller outlets go away there's not as much opportunity for journalists to learn and grow in the very early stages of their career at a place like the la times 
isn't going to recruit those journalists. And so then you end up with a staff that doesn't necessarily represent your city. All of those things um, can be a sort of a ripple effect. And so if we were to get back to community journalism and if the curbed LA's come back and you know, East Side or LA continues to thrive or LA Taco, which is doing incredible work, we work with them quite a bit, um, can really be supported and maybe even have you know, smart membership models where people just pay in just a little bit, um, the same way that I donate to KPCC every month because I, it's so important to me. Um, I think that that provides a lot of hope and it is possible. And I just hope that we get through these next two years um, in the meantime, because the advertising dollar loss is like the legit problem um, that has people like very flummoxed for how do you get out of this hole. Um, Aaron, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add in terms of the money angle. I mean, um, but I would add to the list that Christina, when she was mentioning the publications that have gone away, the LA Weekly has gone away, basically. Yeah. I grew up I grew up reading it, aspiring to write for it, and I'm so thrilled to finally do it because it, it was an alternative. Um, as you know, the Village Village Voice in New York and other it's incredible how many papers we've lost, how many publications have gone away. So there's either there's there's only, you know, we we've lost in the middle ground, that very important middle space, just as we've lost the middle class, just as we've lost, you know, a middle political ground, media's not immune to that and that's really unfortunate um because um we, you know we need these things and i just keep thinking it is not a matter of money we keep saying that but it's amazing what this country how much money we suddenly have when we when we need the money for it, uh, when, when we need um economic relief or it's it's priorities people tend to think of like when you uh when um leon was describing the uh, the boyle heights uh paper that that so you know that's so um uh, good. I started writing for a small um, monthly publication, a black publication that ran out of an apartment in mid city back in the late 80s called Accent LA. We did really good coverage on no money. That's wonderful. But you know what? We shouldn't think of media as a hobby, like, you know, something you do in your spare time. You know, this is something that's mentioned, in the, it's the only profession mentioned in the Constitution. And we really, I, I'm thinking, okay, you know, it can't be an actual government entity like the military, but it sure feels like it needs to be something like that. And maybe we need to have a ministry of, oh no, ministry of media sounds scary, but something, some, some entity that can just help guarantee that we have all these levels of media that we need because people on their own, we have great intentions, but we all can't run around on shoestrings. It just, it's, it's, it, it's not sustainable. And um, I think that, um, uh, you know, we just simply have to find a way. And I think it ha it's connected to us finding a way to re redistribute wealth in this country. That's a tall order. But I think it's an effect of this, this distribution of wealth that we're suffering right now. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that means that we have fewer voices, fewer, less coverage, less, and, and less, less subtlety and all that. So um, I think that's gonna change though, because we do have the resources, you know, you know, we, we all bought into this austerity model, but I just don't buy it. I don't buy it. I can't fund anybody out there, but I don't buy it. I think that, I think once we shift our priorities, um, things will happen. And I, I would like to think we're in the middle of a shift right now. For what it's worth, uh, the state of New Jersey has, has an interesting experiment along these lines. They've got some, uh, state designated funds for local for local outlets in uh, covering oh. different issues and interesting and I I've also heard some um, proposals this is you know kind of the extreme end of this but really thinking of journalism and information more broadly information as as a uh, utility the same way clean water and uh, you know consistent, energy sources you know thinking of information as a public good that yeah. You know, yeah. we're all going to chip in for. Um, I wouldn't yeah. hold my breath, but yes, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to go to Leon, and then we're going to take some questions. I have a suggestion for suggestion for you, Kristen. Why don't you and just public radio do more in Spanish? Uh, we're we're talking about it. We're talking about it actually. Uh, KQED you, up in the Bay Area does some. For, they do. Uh, I think they do a newsletter in Spanish as well. I think it's an interesting thing, but uh, I mean. What I, what I wanted to add uh, is that in the end, 
I think uh, I'll be optimistic and say, but also I, I'll reflect on the nature of our craft. I think we, we as journalists, I mean, we really should be the masters of reinvention, right? I mean, um, and I and I do, maybe I'm being naive, but I do think that in the end it goes back to creativity, both on the editorial side of things and the business side of things. I mean, I can tell you that at Univision, we've invented journalistic segments and community oriented without ever meddling on the editorial side of things, uh, commercial successes as well. I mean, uh, we came up with a concept called um, a Pop Up 34, Pop Up, like restaurants, 34, the channel. Uh, and, and, and the concept was every, every Friday we popped up on unexpected places uh, with a couch outside the subway station, outside, outside the uh, Mariachi Plaza in Ball Heights, and we sit and we sit down at the place and we broadcast half the newscast from there. And people show up and, and we have guests from the community. And, uh, and, it's, and it was very, very successful. It lasted for over two and a half years and, and I had the pleasure of hosting most of them. And, uh, and some of them were really, really remarkable. Others were, you know, kind of funny, but uh, certainly all of them were memorable. And I think it goes, it really goes back to, uh, to creativity. I, 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 just one quick story. I, I, I was speaking with Maria Antonieta Collins, who is one of the most famous reporters uh, in Univision and, and Spanish language media. In the, for, for a, she's had a 45 year career and she was telling me how the beginning of the year she was working on a show that ended. And then she, along with Jorge Ramos, came up with this thing called the Coronavirus Journal, El Diario de Coronavirus, like a two hour midday show in which they connected with uh, cities all across the country to hear the stories of what was going on. That ended and then she was left with, okay, what's next? And she came up with a segment for Despierta America, the morning show, in which she wanted to show the community how much uh, you could take advantage of $20, just $20 to feed a family of six. And so one morning she found herself dicing onion uh, in Despierta America. And she told me, listen, there might be some people who after a 40 year career think this is like a step down or whatever, but journalists, we have to think of the community first. We have to think of how to reinvent ourselves. We have to think of this as a marathon, as a step and then a step and then a step. And for me, uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful lesson. That's a wonderful lesson. Uh, sometimes the, we, we lack the humility to reinvent ourselves and push ourselves further as journalists, but the, it's, it's in the very definition of the craft. That's great. I love that. Reminds me of something uh, Fernando Guerra, who's a professor yeah. at LMU, said at the yeah. beginning of this. He said, you're either going to see preservation or you're going to see innovation. And every institution is going to go one way or the other. That's right. Mm -hmm. so, so with that, let's take some questions. Uh, Jasmine, uh, I think, is going to help us here sort through some of them. So you want to read some and, and you guys can volunteer who wants to answer? Yeah, so thanks everyone su for submitting your questions. One of them is, are reporters feeling threatened by economic conditions and has it affected the newsroom? And specifically, how has it affected students at Annenberg? Yeah, I, I can take that, that one. Although I, I would say we have some better news than we did in May, right? Um, you know, certainly, especially in the local landscape, our students are paying a lot of attention to what's happening. It's also because, um, you know, social media and sort of the, the world that we're in now and being home and isolated and we're all on our phones all the time um, really allows people to follow like blow by blow every furlough and, you know, cut back and pay decrease. Like everybody's really sort of aware of what's happening um, in this industry. And it's scary. And it was particularly scary for our graduates. I have seen in the last three, three or four weeks, a real, um, it's starting to loosen up. I think we've had seen a number of students suddenly get jobs and actually very swiftly, people who were sort of in the pipeline for a job, like are finally having those interviews. Like it feels like things are starting to rebound a little bit. And, you know, in a silver lining, sort of, um, I personally foretell that 
a lot of news outlets as they start hiring, they are going to be looking to our recent grads and people that will have less experience and less um, sort of institutional knowledge of you know what they do, right? People that are getting their start um, because they are more affordable, right? They can hire people who will you know be multi-skilled and be able to work on any platform and who can take a job for less money because they're just starting out um, to rebuild those newsrooms. And so that's great for our students. And I think it's also great for diversifying newsrooms quickly and thinking differently and getting that generation into newsrooms. It's also really difficult for that mid-level of journalists who, you know, are out of luck and it's harder for them to get hired because they require a higher salary or they have more experience. And then, you know, for the readers, you're also losing out on some of that institutional memory. So there's definitely a, a good and bad in that. Um, but I have found that the, the scariness, it helps people study and also innovate. You know, we talked about the innovation a second ago, um, really think about what um, types of business models might be different. You've seen a lot of people become their own publishers. You know, we have plenty of students who are doing regular TikTok shows on their Twitter to get noticed. Um, you have students who are sharing work on Medium. You have, um, and not just students, I've seen that all over the place, right? You have journalists in LA who are starting job boards or job newsletters for other journalists because they know how hard it is to get that gig or providing resources to be freelancers. So the model of how, you know, is, is somebody going to go and be a staff reporter at a newspaper anymore? Like, maybe not, but like there's contract jobs available and there's lots of other things and there's clearly a need. And, and I think there's clearly a desire on behalf of the audience to have these gaps filled. Uh I would just say a, a contract job is an oxymoron, but um, <laughs> um, it's it's uh, we what we didn't say. I just want to say just as an over, you know, kind of overarching all of this is there's an all-out assault on media, um, particularly on print reporters, and um, it's unfortunate because we've been experiencing at least 15 to 20 years of downsizing consolidation, you know, people losing jobs. It's a very, not to scare any prospective journalists out there, but it's not good. It is not, you know, and the internet, we haven't talked about how, you know, people get, you know, the internet is a wonderful tool, disseminate, it disseminates information, but the, uh, it has really contributed to the chaotic business model. You just don't make money on the internet the way you make money in print. So, all, but you know, so I, I am often discouraged when I look, think about all this, but I'll tell you for a few years, for several years, I was journalism advisor at the University of Redlands, which is a liberal arts college out in the Inland Empire. And I just assumed that no students were interested in print journalism, that young people were not interested or that it was, but there was a great interest in journalism. I mean, you know, we can talk, the money is one thing, but the actual, the function and the importance of journalism was not lost on these young people as I'm sure is not lost on the young people at USC. And that is always the hope because people understand no matter you know, um, uh, the economic picture, we understand more and more clearly how important journalism is. I think we just have to be careful about, you know, the problem with the internet is that, you know, you, there's so much information. Uh, some people just offer it up for free, but, but journalism is a discipline and a practice. And we, I think, um, uh, you know, it has to be compensated or it's not going to be done well. That's the bottom line. So, but I think that the act of the ongoing interest in journalism on the part of young folk is what will, is my hope for the future. Thank you. Um, this is for Leon. Leon, you mentioned that the pandemic prompted your organization to listen more to your audience. How did you do that in practical terms? I'll, I'll answer the question. Uh, but first, I want to add something to the previous discussion with, a, with an example from, from USC, uh, from the alumni. Uh, I think uh, as journalists, we should, we should have uh, universal interests, but we also should learn the value of uh, learning a source, right? And specializing uh, on one particular beat. Um, and uh, I have one, one example that I think is, uh, if you make yourself useful, there's, there's clearly uh, a bigger shot of you making it in this very complicated business. Um, I have a, a student of mine, Tomas Mier, whom I met probably the first day I, I, I went to USC or second day we went to USC and he approached me and we started talking and then he became my student. And then uh, after, after, after I had him in class, it was, I mean, he was 
probably his first year at USC. Then he became a part of the editorial staff at the, the Trojan, I think is the name of the, of the, the school newspaper. Uh, that he worked there for a while. And then he, um, he, he went to the LA Times and he offered his expertise on all matters USC to begin with, which was like the basic thing he knew in life because he had worked for the Trojan. And with the, all of the USC scandal that happened uh, and, and, and the pieces of news that, that happened around the school and blah, 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 uh, that we all heard about, uh, Tomas was the one who translated them for for the for the LA Times, and he just got his first byline. Actually, he's now up to his second byline on a different matter, TikTok and and Hispanic parents, which was I found fascinating for the Times. So I think that there's a, there's a lesson there again uh, uh, in in this process of reinvention uh, and and also uh, just just the lesson of, of becoming becoming useful, right, and and learning a bit, uh, which is very basic, but sometimes we we forget it. Um, well, we have a very open relationship with our audience. It is very peculiar. Our <laughs> assignment desk, it is peculiar, I think. I mean, we have a very active assignment desk. And people call us uh, seeking guidance. I mean, uh, in our prep call uh, yesterday, I, I described Univision as a sort of lighthouse for the community. And it really is that. I mean, we, we get calls from the, from the community, uh, people seeking uh, companionship, solace, but also solutions to very specific problems. And so uh, uh, people who call us who say, we just got evicted, uh, and could you please come? And so immediately a reporter from the team goes and takes a look at the specific problems, problem and demands answer. I mean, we are always there on call. Like, uh, like a lighthouse, like a lighthouse. And that just uh, grew exponentially during the pandemic. We expanded, for example, our um, uh, coverage to uh, social media. We, uh, we have uh, uh, set up frequent Facebook Lives with the community, listening to their, their, their concerns. Sometimes we don't have the answers, but we certainly take notes. And, and then we process them journalistically through, through our, our, our uh, uh, assignment desk, news desk, and redacción, you know, the newsroom. Um, and so it's, it's a very practical process, but it's nothing new. It's just been much more frequent and, and intense. Thank you. Um, another question, where do colors come from to support journalists um, to the local, to write local stories, especially investigative ones. What was the first part of the question? I didn't yeah, hear. That too. Yeah, where will the dollar, the dollars come from to support journalists to write local stories, especially investigative ones? You know, I mean, one of the things is it's like I sort of reference about nonprofits, right? You know, you look at there are plenty of organizations that come up on an issue, right? Or they try to have, um, you know, a little bit more of a focus or a point of view on something, and they're going to get funders who are supportive of that and they want to advance their agenda. And I personally think as long as that's transparent for the audience, great. You, know, you might as well do that. Why not? Um, you do have the issue where you have, you know, 50 gazillion news outlets and it's not, you know, one centralized one. And then frequently, sometimes for these organizations have to partner with a large, um, you know, traditional outlet to get as much notice for those investigations, but you've seen it done. Um, in addition to that, it, it goes back to paying, right? You have seen at a time, a weird time, just in general for this country and for journalism over the last three and a half years huge booms in the subscriber base for the Washington Post and the New York Times, in part because they were digging deep into issues that people really cared about. And they published a series of things that were extremely um, relatable to people and deep. And that's because they invested in their journalism and they were not shy about telling their audience we're expecting everyone to invest in this journalism. If you care about this type of thing, you will too. And that's been really heartening for me to see. And I think it's a possible thing to duplicate in other places. It's just harder if you don't have the starting resources of the New York Times and the Washington Post. And the Wall Street Journal, I should point out. I would just add, again, this is the money question. Um, one thing I thought about too is, you know, um, journalism became, uh, the, the funding and the money collapsed as 
businesses in America were collapsing and consolidating. So that relates directly to the ad revenue. For example, when I was growing up, the LA Times had a million advertisers. There were many different department stores. There were many different car dealerships. You know, American the economy was different. Now we have, I think I heard yesterday, we have four banks controlling 70% of banking. We have, you know, we have three major retailers, Target and Macy's. I mean, it's a much different scene. So that means much less advertising dollars. Um, and so how do we grow that? I don't really know. I'm not, the, I'm not an economist or a consumer retail person, but that's a huge problem. I do believe there is money. I think it's just the problem that keeps coming back to the fact it's concentrated in a few hands. And those hands are not that interested in journalism. You know what I mean? <laughs> so um, this, is a, this is a tough nut to crack. Um, but I think that once, again, once the priorities shift, um, we will see a shift in journalism because it, as Christina said, it's become very clear that everybody depends on those, those, um, those organizations like the New York Times and Washington Post that have the troops and the resources to report, not just locally, but nationally. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so we, we all need to be like that. All, you know, LA certainly could be like that. It's a major city. It's kind of incredible that it has one major paper. Um, but again, that's just, local, that's just local priorities. And I would just add to Kristen's statement a while back about LA not really seeing itself as a, as a city worthy of having first-class coverage. I think, um, I think that there is a problem, a self-image problem that we continue to have as a, as a, as a place that, that needs and deserves um, really good coverage. And it can't be scattershot and it can't be just you know, entertainment journalism, it can't be that. And I think we're finally starting to understand that. I think I would add just to, to what Aaron said there, if you don't mind, and that is, you know, one of, as, as Christina has recently discovered, LA is the best city. And, and we on the West Coast, we have a really long storied tradition of being the first to do, you know, from aerospace to you know, for better, for worse, criminal justice policy. Like there's a lot of things that start in California that we export to the rest of the world in terms of ideas and values. And I think, you know, there's collaboration is something um, we don't talk about enough, but, you know, if we thought of LA, if, if organizations thought of themselves not as competitors, but as part of a larger news ecosystem that is, you know, designed to really serve Angelinos. I mean, you see people pay for what's value to them, valuable to them. You know, we have to be valuable enough to pay for. And that means really meeting people where they're at, the way, you know, Leon talks about um, the Lighthouse, uh, the work we're doing with audience engagement. It's like, you have to meet people where they are and report on the issues that matter to them most. And if we do that in a more equitable way and I think there's a there's a potential for us to break some molds here in Los Angeles. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, someone writes, I used to split my time between KNX and KFWB when I was riding in my car and need a traffic info and the news. What is a real economic pro problem that prevents LA from being able to support more stations? Um, I would just say it's the same problem just in of dealers. Now this happened, this, there's this whole thing that goes back to the FCC and how it allowed this to happen. But again, there used to be a huge diversity of media outlets. There were local stations, local radio stations, local TV stations. There were nationally owned stations and syndicates. There was a, there was an ecosystem, as Krista said, that all changed in the, in the 90s. This has to do with deregulation of media, okay? So, so what happened over the years is this collapse and consolidation of a lot of these outlets, and we are left with standing with you know a few a few stations standing, hanging on, um, and that has been a huge huge problem. And and our government has let it happen, and um, uh, because uh, there's supposed to be there was there was once upon a time something called you know there was a, a, a what was it called fair. Um, Oh God, something like Fair and Balanced Media Act or something like that, 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 that made sure, ensure that there was a diversity um, and, um, of, of outlets and competition. And that has just vanished. So um, that's what keeps us from having more outlets, frankly. And radio um, has become, you know, became a 
nineties and, and then Fox and, you know, I mean, so unfortunately you have too few owners, um, some of whom are, you know, uh, the, the main interest is not news or journalism, but profits. And this continues to be a problem in American media and affects, and by the way, you know, one of the big, one of the, the most disturbing things that's happened um, in the last, I don't know, 10 years is the shift of news. News is now content and content to me sounds like stuff you put in a box or <laughs> stuff without worth. <laughs> yeah, I don't know stuff. I'm going to throw away and put at the out, uh, curb. And so we see new news is news. Of course, have always has always been a product that's not, you know, necessarily negative, but it's become, it's become, I think content is more insidious than product because it's just stuff you fill a hole with. And that's, you know, we, unfortunately, that's how many people in business look at news, like how, you know, what's the best thing we can put out there so people will respond to it. Um, not a new problem, but it is, it is, has a particular resonance right now. So um, we just need to, we need to read, we need to bring that diversity back. And again, uh, there's a way out of this. We got into this. There is a way out. I can't, I don't know all the details, but I know there's a way out, right? Thank you. Um, this is for, for all of you. So how do you correct for blind spots in your coverage? And what allows news outlets to become aware of what, what those blind spots are? I can start. I mean, this is the, the really, it's always been a critical question. It's even more critical at this moment, right? Um, so some of it is just like deep education, um, both you know from your peers, um, but it also really takes a lot of education of people at the top because uh, there are blockers to coverage, I would say, right? A reporter might have an amazing story idea and you when you bring it hire someone who doesn't understand the particular community you're talking about or the issue or why it's important or maybe they've never faced a struggle in their life you know they can very easily shut it down or delay it or you know if it's not as sexy as something else um stop that and so that creates a blind spot in your coverage that's not even in your, your control right you know if you you if can be the the most aware person out there and really informed and really able to have the most diverse and interesting and important story ideas but if you don't have the support institutionally like that can be a big problem um and i found that in many news outlets that i've worked in um but it's also about talking to as many people as possible you know and when i was a reporter i used to end every conversation with who are three other people i should talk to and which one of them is going to disagree with you Right, because I just felt like I need to know as much as I possibly can. And even if I never quote those three other people, at least I can kind of expand my own personal network on something that I'm learning about. Um, and those, fortunately, like that's the qualities that most of us have as journalists inherently, right? We're deeply curious. We wanna know how the world works. We, we're social, we like talking to people, we like learning. And so if you're doing that right, you will more than likely have a pretty good um, foundation. And then you also just, whether that's through your schooling or through training or through talking to others or just devoting in your own education, you have to expand your boundaries beyond what you're comfortable. Um, whether that's neighborhoods or types of people or issues that, you know, it's, you, you have to read everything. And that's like, it's really easy to say. And it's really, really easy to say in academia now where like, I get to do that all the time. And that's like part of my job. You don't always have time to do that as a journalist, but it's, it is deeply important and especially important here in LA. Thank you. And we have um, a final yes. question. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, so what skills uh, do you recommend people further in their careers trying to learn to stay relevant and at the top of their game? Hmm. That's a good question. Should I take it? Sure. All right. Since I like the question. It's a good <laughs> question. Uh, I mean, frankly, <laughs> this is going to sound very boring to the person who asked that question, but you have to know how to write. <laughs> I mean, uh, we are we are we are now uh, in this day and age uh, with TikTok and Snapchat, and I mean, uh, the, my, my students and, and students in general at USC, uh, they were amazing. I saw some things that they did on Snapchat, like a, a whole newscast newscast on Snapchat that was very very catchy and really. Uh, 
Uh, I, I was, I was, um, I mean, in, in 45 seconds, I learned three new stories and the headlines and all that. Uh, but I always went back to my students and told them, you have to learn how to write properly in English. And uh, ideally in more than English, because it, one, one thing that has always surprised me about the United States, um, or at least my experience in the United States now as a quasi-citizen is how few people speak two languages or write two languages fluently. I understand, I mean, English is the lingua franca of the world and we are in America, but um, uh, to, to be bilingual is such an immense asset, right? Such an, an immense asset. But my one advice, there are many, many advices that I, I think I've already tried, I've tried to focus on that during this conversation about how to stay relevant, how to reinvent ourselves, how to how to uh, uh, face this, this new era and these challenges that this era represents. But I would go back to the basic one, which is just, just write, just write and do it properly. Because if you really can communicate your, uh, your journalism through writing, uh, then platforms will come a calling, let me put it that way. Uh, that's, that's, that's the thing I cherish the most about, about what, what, the way I grew up as a journalist. I've been writing nonstop for journal for for uh, for newspapers and journals or whatever since I was 17 years old, and if if I die with nothing else, I know I'll die with at least a well-trained pen, and that's uh, sometimes if it's not enough, at least that's a great first step. Yeah, I would I would add to that. Uh, yeah, right, because um, uh, in any language, although English, of course, but I mean. I am always surprised at how poorly some people, some college students write. And it's really important to be able to do that, not just as a print reporter, but as any kind of journalist, because it's the ability to get to, you know, to sort of, as, what is the story in 800 words or a thousand words or whatever? And you constantly have to ask that question, what's really going on here? And, and I had a friend who told me when you go, when you're a reporter and you, you're doing a daily story, and you go talk to people and you have notes and you're driving back to the office, you should know what the lead is in your head. You know, you should know that. So it's not just writing is sort of the last part of it, but it's also kind of always looking at the story and, and asking what is really going on. It's, I guess it's that curiosity we keep talking about and the willingness to, to I hate to say this after I just condemned it, looking at, you know, talking to everybody, looking at all sides, no, by blind spots, I think the, the former question was about reporters' biases. Of course we have biases. We all have, our, we all have our points of view and some of them are valid. It's just always kind of keeping that, being aware of your biases. And sometimes biases are not negative. You have to make judgments about the information you're getting. I think the main, there are two kinds of information. You know, there's, there's information like what the hell, what, what happened, which is hard enough to discern because we're in the age of misinformation. That's number one. Number two and more important is what does this mean? What does this information mean? And that's where journalists really play a really critical role in society. But first, yeah, you have to get the facts right. What is it? And the second thing is what does it mean? And that I am constantly asking myself that question. Um, and um, all stories connect to other stories and you all kind of always have to connect the dots. Right, all local story. There's always a bigger picture it connects to. So I would say to always do, you know, what are those connections? Ask yourself those questions. And three, really, well, is that three? I don't know. But always read other publications. I grew up reading newspapers. That's how I learned to be a reporter. It was like what they're getting at. So um, uh, whether you're reading online or in print, um, read, just read all the time. I think we have time for one last question. Jasmine? Yes, so the question is, I'm a high school student journalist and a sports editor for my school's newspaper. What can student journalists do to help local news both now and in the future? Uh, I'm sure we probably all want to talk about this, but um, good for you. It's great, you know, you're starting with experience, right? So that's excellent. 
but don't be afraid to reach out to, you know, I don't know where you live, but like go to whatever your local community is. If there's a blog that covers your community, um, if you are really um, paying a lot of attention to your community and you can start your own medium page uh, where you can kind of just cover the issues, like you could build something for yourself really quickly and a name, um, you can use social media to your benefit um, for anyone listening. If you want to be a journalist, I recommend you are careful about what your public social media persona is. Um, it, if you need to split them up, you can have one that's professional, one that's just for friends, and that one that's just for friends should not be able to be found by a future employer. Um, but you know, be able to get out there, and you know, maybe you're covering a high school sport. There's a lot of people of interest in that, so develop your own hashtag that people can follow. Like if you can kind of build that up, you will come into your college experience with, with both experience and then also a following. That's awesome. That's the kind of thing all of us, you know, we've worked with young journalists or we hired people, like we want to see that. Um, and then the other thing is like, don't be afraid to just walk in. If there's a newspaper, just walk in and say, I want the experience. They might not pay you, it's possible. Um, they should pay you, that's ideal. But if you're available and you can afford to give them a few hours and build your experience by getting the name of that bigger institution on your resume early, that's great. You know, I have so many friends who, you know, I started as a receptionist at the San Jose Business Journal when I was just my sophomore year in college over the summer. Um, and I just annoyed the editor every single day and said, anything I can do to help, anything I can do to help. And finally, somebody called them sick and they needed something to help and the rest is history. And I know somebody who started in the mailroom at the Washington Post, and now he's their national editor, right? So it, it can take a long time, but if you go in and you show your interest, or even just walk in and say, hey, I'm really eager and interested. Um, does somebody, and obviously this is slightly different in pandemic times, you know, do you have five minutes for coffee? Or can I treat you to a Zoom meeting where we just talk about how you got your start in journalism? Like people inherently want to help. And that's something that you should never be afraid to ask. The worst you're gonna hear is no, I don't have the time. And you know, if you're out there and you're, you're showcasing what you're passionate about, people will always think of you for a long, long time and they will be connecting you with those opportunities when they come up. Okay, is that the, that, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Gordon jumps in here or, or if I'm supposed to wrap it up, but uh, <laughs> I, will, I will just take a moment to thank all of you. This has been terrific. Um, really appreciate the sure. time and the terrific questions we've gotten as well. Um, I would let Gordon uh, wrap up with the big thoughts that he has. <laughs> all right, oh, there we go. Sorry, the, the, the joy of the current moment, we've been looking for the analogies. That was me uh, spilling water, which is the, you know, the analog of not being able to get my camera back on. Um, I, I wanted to thank everybody. I, I think as uh, being able to sit through this conversation and listen, I think we're appreciative. So I want to first thank our fantastic panel, Aaron, Leon, Christina, and Kristen for their insights and for making time in what is obviously everyone has so much and and I hope that the audience heard the same degree of reflexiveness that you hear in how everyone's rethinking whether it's your constraints or your production model or your classes everybody here is revisiting what they're doing uh, the panel was the joint production of a lot of folks at Southern California Public Radio and USC Annenberg so Carl John Tony Jasmine Reggie Tim Mira Olivia and Jim we appreciate all of their great work and for the audience I just want to encourage and say um, I think this is a really pretty proof positive of the value of this beginning conversation about what it means within Southern California to be thinking in a more proactive way. Um, I heard a lot, but one that I really would encourage folks to consider is when you heard Aaron describe the way in which the broader, sometimes what we call structural conditions like gentrification are really not removed from our human experience. And I think as we're seeing individual restaurants close, questions about what's happening with foreclosures and evictions based on the expiration of those, there's the real question of human tragedy, which is being documented. And there's the structural effect it's gonna have on our communities and on each other that journalists need to be a part of. And an important value of this dialogue is to say, if Los Angeles does not have the journalism that it needs and the journalism that it deserves as a world-class city, Aaron's observation is absolutely right that we will miss and we will be in some ways part of the enabling of those social forces in a way that is not inevitable or needs to happen. And I would give one small part to reinforce Kristen's comment about the value of collaboration. 
Leon observed the fantastic student Tomas, who's an amazing young journalist who just graduated in May. The collaboration that USC and the LA Times brought together was produced and part of how Tomas working with the LA Times was a reflection of the need for folks who maybe had separate models or separate pathways to say in this moment, is there a better need to collaborate? Is there a better way to work forward? Um, that was out of a byproduct of understanding that the LA Times was trying to scale up of how do you tell the human loss across the Southland from the pandemic? Um, and I think one of the things that we're going to encourage in the following panels is to be looking towards some of those discussions of what are other ways for the news media, educational institutions, the public sector to revisit some of these questions, because I really think it ultimately concludes with the question that Kristen raised about what's the ecosystem and what's the public good that's associated, because if we're really only going to rely on individual consumer decision making, then we may have missed our focus and we should instead be focusing on what's the best way to click or what's the best way to generate more ad revenue. But I think we're talking about a broader conversation of there's an important value of local news in Southern California. The folks in this discussion are interested in leading it forward. So thank you for taking the time in this first installment and we very much hope that you can join us in the future for the upcoming parts. So thanks everyone and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Yes. Thanks, Thank so you, Gordon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Kristen. Great so job. Well, thank yes, you, Kristen. Kristen. Thanks, everyone.